good. All right, all right. All right, there we go. Now I need to think. Okay. Uh, let me go through this. Uh, um, as you can see on your front page, the total was out of 124. I think the class average was almost identical to the first exam. Um, so, um, so, but there was a lot of movement, so some people did worse than the first exam, some people did better than the first exam, but it overall ended up kind of um, <coughs> balance, balancing itself out. Uh, so, at the grades are already in Moodle, so you can go ahead and check those out. Uh, you definitely want to do that because you need to see um, how well you need to do on the third exam. Uh, most of you are doing quite well on your final project scores. Um, and so if you're, uh, the way Moodle works is if you keep getting good scores, if you're getting good scores on your final project and you keep getting good scores on your final project, it's not going to change your overall score because what Moodle does is it assumes that you're going to continue to get the same kind of scores on your project that you're currently getting. So if, uh, if you're hoping that a good score on your project is going to bring up your overall grade, that can only be true if you're currently struggling on your final project and trying to improve it, okay? Um, so uh, if you don't like your grade and you're already doing a good job on the final project, that comes down to then this last uh, exam here near the end of the semester. Yes. Are the grades like weighted for, for like the tests? Are they like weighted correctly in Moodle? Yes, they are weighted correctly. Uh, so so look at that that gives you a really good feel for where you're standing and uh, where where you're headed. Okay. Uh, just so you know the final project is starting to ramp up in weighting now. So the next the, the one that you just did last week and the ones upcoming for this week, next week, and after you get back from fall break will be weighted more heavily than, than the previous ones because they, they are um, of uh, larger size and, and difficulty than, than some of the early ones were. Uh, so <clears throat> you do have a chance to, to raise your grade if, if in that uh, side of the um, class if you need to. Let me quickly go over uh, the questions. I'm not going to go through every question, uh, but I'll cover some of the um, highlights or lowlights depending upon um, how you did. And um, so uh, let's start with the definitions. Uh, for zero sum gain, uh, what I'm specifically looking here is that you recognize that the, the gain from one player had to be immediately offset from the other player. And that's where the zero sum comes from. The gain and the loss have to equal zero overall with, with each other. So it's not um, that you have two players. It's not that you can try all combinations of, of players. It turns out you, it's not even that you have an finite number of choices. There are zero sum games that have an infinite a number of options available to a player. As an examler, example, if you're a gambler um, and you're gambling with other, one other individual, the amount that you gamble is infinite in choice, uh, but uh, what you gain is what they lose and vice versa. Right? That's an example of a zero-sum game with an infinite number of choices available to you. All right? So it's, it's a matter of those two uh, balancing out. Uh, min and max strategy, um, I wasn't specifically looking for it within the context of a game, but uh, I did not count that against you uh, because that's what we looked at specifically in the class. In the last chapter, or the second to last chapter of the uh, class, we'll be talking about some decision making strategies uh, and we will revisit this idea of min and max, uh, specifically min and max regret. Uh, so what we're looking here is that we're going to maximize some value uh, and then we that's over a couple of options and then we're going to pick the minimum value from, from those maximums. So we apply the minimum to our maximums 
uh, to get the, the final result that we want. All right. Uh, capacity constraint. Uh, what I was looking for here is that it's a limit on the flow across a particular uh, network um, link. Okay, a lot of you put capacity on a node rather than a, a link. So the capacity is about how much can travel uh, rather than how much supply we have or how much demand we have. Those would be supply constraints or demand constraints. Um, and so that's where a number of you lost points on this particular problem. Uh, finally, a network problem. Uh, what I'm specifically looking for here is that you understand that there are nodes or vertices connected by edges or arcs. Uh, and that that connection of those pieces are going to be used to represent a solution to, to your problem. And so most people, if you lost points here, didn't mention nodes or, or arcs. Uh, many of you gave examples of network problems, but that's uh, not a, a complete uh, list. And so you would have maybe lost one or, or, or two points uh, on that if you didn't specifically mention arcs. Uh, or edges and nodes and vertices in, in this problem here. All right. Uh, question number two. Uh, my hope was, since you had seen an example of this in the practice exam, that this would be uh, more straightforward. Uh, what I did is I basically updated the numbers for the most recent um, fiscal year. Um, and, and then went from there. So how much of each fund should be allocated? You look at your decision variable, uh, and you see that in the final value. Uh, so in, the, in this case, you allocate 30.7% uh, needs to be for the dividend growth, 66.5% uh, for the long-term bond, and the 20, I mean the 2.7 percent in the, the prime cap. Those were the, the values there. Um, and most of you got those. Uh, if if people lost points there, they rounded wrong usually. Um, part B. <coughs> um, suppose you had a more risk tolerant investor. Okay. So now we're going from a 3% loss to a 10% loss. And where most of you lost points on here is that uh, what you didn't realize is the right-hand side value is going down. It's going even smaller. From negative 3, which you can see in the right-hand side in those constraints at the top, it's going from negative 3 to ten, negative 10. So it's dropping by 7. So the, the right-hand side value is going to be negative, the change in the right hand side value is negative 7 from negative 3 to, to negative 10. Um, and so we're going to multiply our shadow prices by that negative 7 value. A lot of you gave me uh, 10, the, the absolute value, rather than difference from where you started to where you ended, or even uh, 13 because you missed signage in, in there. Um, but the, the value should have been negative 7. Uh, some of you just checked the change and gave me a positive 7. And then you answered that the, the, the result would be a decrease in the return on investment. There should have been something clicking in your head because I asked what there was an increase in return on investment in, in that case. So something should have uh, triggered on that line. Um, so then what do you do? You take the shadow price for the, the investment uh, years that have a uh, shadow price, a non-zero shadow price, and you multiply that by negative seven. Uh, if you did that, you should have multiplied that times the 2018 returns and the 2008 returns, because those are the ones that had shadow prices that were non-zero. And I forget what the result was, something like three, a little bit over, uh, three percent being, if I remember correctly. However, there this was this was my trick question here. If you look at uh, 2018 and you look at the allowable decrease, the allowable decrease was only 0.8 percent. 
Um, so you actually can't use that to predict the value. Um, and so the, the right answer is you don't know, given the sensitivity analysis, you, uh, you would have to actually rerun the, the values to, to figure it out. Um, so that would have given you full points if you did every, if you multiply it by negative seven, you would have gotten six out of, of, of eight. So we've gotten most of the point uh, from, from that. Um, part C. Um, the constraint for the 2013 return is uh, that column, that, that fourth column there. And what you do is you multiply that column by how, what percentage of your allocation is allocated to each one of these funds. So it would have been 500 index times 32.18 plus the dividend growth times 31.53 plus, and you do that for all five funds. And then you need to make sure that that's greater than or equal to negative three. You see the negative three in the right hand side of your constraint in, in your sensitive activity analysis. So you know that it has to be larger than that particular value right there. Um, then the extra credit one, the reason why it's 9.552 is because if you were to give equal probability to each of these five scenarios happening, um, then that would be the expected value of the return on the 500 index. And you can see that if you take the average of these five values, you would find out that that happens to be 9.552, which is what the expected value would be in an equal probability case. Okay. All right. All right, so now we're on to new, uh, new looking problems where you had to um, think a little bit differently from the practice problems um, to, to apply them. So the first one was the cruise ships. Uh, one and this one was meant to be similar in nature to the um, airline reservations or the hotel reservations where you've got some sort of uh, capacity um, in in your uh, product that you're you're limiting uh, so in this case uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to maximize our profit Um, and I know this part was a little bit unclear, so I didn't count off uh, for this particular issue. But that profit should have included both directions for the four nights. Because you can sell a ticket for one direction, and then you can sell a ticket back uh, on the, the other direction. So the profit should have been um, uh, $200.00. Uh, times the one going for the four night uh, Miami to Co Miami to Cozumel plus two hundred dollars four night Cozumel back to, to Miami. We can sell both of those uh, tickets uh, plus again to twenty uh, four night. Uh, um, I, let's add another variable. Basic four night Miami. The Cozumel Oceanside plus 220, four night Cozumel Oceanside, and finally 600, uh, 600 sweet, So this would have been the, the profit from our four night things. Like I said, I didn't count you off if you didn't include these three things because I, I know that was a little confusing and I didn't want. To take that off nature. But you should have then included the eight night package um, as part of that. So that is um, 350 um, eight night basic plus 385 uh, eight night ocean plus 1050 eight night sweep. So that's our that's our profit that we want to um, Maximize, and our decision variables are just how many of these different tickets we want to make available. Okay, 
So there are, there are several constraints that we have to deal with. The first is that we only have a certain number of rooms available. Right? So, um, so this is subject to um, our four-night Miami Cosmo basic plus our eight-night basic had to be less than or equal to 330. Right? We couldn't sell more than those because that's how many rooms we had available to us. Uh, and similarly, our four-night uh, Cosmo in Miami also had to be less than 330. And then we repeat this for the other two room types. We have four-night Oceanside, and that would be less than 400. Um, and then we have our um, four-night suite plus our eight-night suite. That would be less than 70. So that made sure that we didn't sell too many tickets given the, the rooms that we had available to us. The other thing that we had to do was make sure that we didn't sell too many tickets based on the expected demand. Um, and so there we have our, our demand uh, in our thing, and so we know um, that this is going to be less than 150. And we just do all um, nine of, of those constraints for each of the, the different capacities we have in, in our hotel rooms. Okay. So we maximize our profit, we make sure we don't sell too many rooms, and we, meet the, we try to meet as best we can our demand, but we don't offer ones that aren't going to be sold because then we'll, we'll have an empty room in the in water. So that's what we did for problem three. Yes? 15. think through what the, the options for the, the generals were, um, and once you got that, you did a very good job of being able to turn this into a, to a zero-sum game, right? You, what you did is you had to think, um, you could do it in terms of the largest, right? We could allocate four battalions to the largest, and that leaves us two remaining, so that means then our medium and small both have one. Or we could do three for our largest, and, and then we've got three battalions left. So there's got to be a two and one balance there, and so the only way we can allocate that is, again, via this mechanism. And then finally, we could put two in the largest, um, and the only way we can allocate the remaining four is two and two without violating. So, in essence, there are three options available to each general. They can allocate these, one of these three um, ways of putting our battalions on, on the field. So, I'm just going to, for space considerations when I draw it, I'm just going to draw what the largest one is because that uniquely identifies the other two values in, in this um, situation here. So, um, largest four, largest three, largest two, largest four, largest three, largest two. And so now, if you um, if you're doing the same uh, number of battalions to each side. That's clearly going to be a tie for, between the generals because 
there's there's no way for for one to win more than the other. All right. So if we deploy this against this, it ends up being a tie, right? Because here are the biggest wins, here are the bottom one wins, and and here they tie. So this is also a tie, and it's symmetric. <coughs> And then here, the top one wins one, but loses both of these battles right here. So actually, if you choose that, you can, you can have a negative one here, right? And vice versa, if you do this, you beat that one. Again, symmetric. So finally, we just compare these. Here, the top one wins. Here, the bottom one wins. In fact, this is given as an example. In, in the question, so you can see that this is a tie as well. So that is part A, what, it, what I was looking for, right there. Alright, so you can see you win in this case if you allocate two to everyone, and the other person allocates four to their largest. <coughs> for, um, for part B, what you need to do then is you had to look at the row maximums. Because remember what we're doing is we're saying, if I made this choice, what's the worst possible thing to happen to me? What if my opponent was, you know, had some advanced scouting and knew what I was going to do, or you know, had a crystal ball and could look into the future, or whatever the case is, and they made the worst possible move for me? What would happen? Well, this would happen right here, right? And so I need to assume that worst case, and that I'm going to lose if I make that allocation. But in this case, well, I don't even have to think, right? If I choose three, I know it's going. That's guaranteed to be a tie, right? Um, and here I could win, uh, but again, if we've got uh, bad luck or an intelligent opponent, we should end up tying, right? So these are the three choices. So I can either assume I'm going to lose, or I can assume I'm going to tie. Right? So um, I'm going to circle these as a, a pair because they end up giving us the, the same result. Likewise, this general is going to go through the same thing. If they do this, they're going to um, cause us to win. If they do this, they know they're going to tie, and in this one, uh, they're not going to make us lose because we're too smart to let them do that. Right? So when they look at this, they say, well, I'm not going to let them win. I'm going to pick one of these two and therefore not have any difference. So by doing this, then you should have been able to identify in Part B that this was a pure strategy because what I've chosen versus what my opponent's chosen are equal. Right? So there's no expectation that my change of behavior is going to result in some better uh, solution. I'm not going to do anything probabilistically and get better results than if I just do it um, in a fixed choice. I, I make this choice, it's going to be the best choice, um, and my opponent is going to make the corresponding best choice, and it's going to be their 